So, Phil, I wanted to start with your book, The Death of Consensus. I must say it's one of the best political books I've read in the past two years. But let's just start with your thesis, because it's quite interesting. It's quite original. You try and impose on the 20th century this theory of politics. Tell us about that. Okay, so where I start with this is that consensus does not mean that everyone agrees about everything. What I do think it means, and this is the subtitle of my book, A Hundred Years of British Political Nightmares, is that enough people across the mainstream of politics, the mainstream of the public, agree that there is some terrible thing Mm. that we must not allow to happen. So after the war, we must never go back to the mass unemployment of the 1930s. After the 70s, we must never go back to the strikes and chaos and inflation of the 1970s and so on. And my argument is that where that breaks down, and I should say, you know, I'm in no way arguing that this is neat or cyclical or predictable, but that uh, where that breaks down, where the death of consensus starts to happen, is when another nightmare presents itself, which seems to be even worse than the one that we've been basing everything on. But you can't just easily let go of the old one, partly because some people are very deeply invested in it genuinely. Others have their sort of power entrenched by it, whether that's the unions after the war or finance at certain other points. And so there's a long, nasty, struggle of the battle of nightmares that goes on for you know decade or so yeah. uh, during which it looks like democracy can't function you get lots of talk about you know extremist alternatives and finally the second nightmare the new nightmare supersedes the old one in uh, in enough people's minds that you get to the beginnings of a new settlement so in 1972 when unemployment hits one million all hell breaks loose ted heath and harold wilson the two party leaders have both had unemployed fathers in the 1930s yeah. and everything has to change jump forward 10 years and six days when it hits three million And it's a sad thing, but it can't be helped because it's no longer the dominant nightmare. Mm. So that's the transition. I mean, let's go back to the 1930s. You had this sort of Victorian economic consensus, Mm -hmm. and that was undermined by all of that employment that we saw then. Mm -hmm. But we didn't get the 1945 consensus until we had the uh, horrors of World War II, until we had Mm -hmm. uh, a wartime government, until we had forced consensus between the two political parties because they both had to come into the government uh, rally industry direct where the economy was. So you have this sort of interregnum between the consensus whereby it's not clear which direction politics is going, but some of the old ideas are slipping away. And then tell us about, so so then we had the post-war consensus, you know, the creation of the welfare state um, under Attlee and there were some attempts to uh, reverse parts of it in the 50s, but Mostly, the Conservative government respected uh, the settlement that was decided in 1945. And then that started to break down in the 60s and 70s. What happened then? Well, so after the war, you have this long period uh, of economic growth. And so actually, the threat of mass unemployment is not super kind of uh, to the fore. What starts to happen, though, is that, as I say, another nightmare starts to present itself, or two, really. One is, and they're seen as being linked through uh, inflationary wage demands, one is higher and higher inflation, and one is the power of the trade unions, which partly expresses itself not actually through wage strikes, but through sort of demarcation disputes and mm. what are called wildcat strikes, on official strikes. You've got a very different polity in the trade union movement in the 1960s than you had in the 1940s. It's much less top-down, much more aspirational, actually. And so that starts to come to a head at the end of the 1960s, when uh, Labour government, Barbara Castle, as uh, Employment and Productivity Secretary, mm. uh, decides that she wants to try and bring the trade unions, as though into sort of bringing the 1945 settlement to fruition, bring them further into government. And in return for that, just get them to agree to a couple of things about, you know, ballots before strikes and cooling off periods and so on. And this kicks off a terrible nightmare in the minds of the trade unions because they sprang as a movement in the 19th century from great powerlessness. And so the spectre of law, the spectre of statute brings up the idea of hostile conservative governments, biased judges doing all sorts of things. And they will not have this settlement that Castle offers in 1969. And the person who is instrumental in shooting that down is the Labour Home Secretary, Jim Callaghan. Fast forward 10 years, when Callaghan is Prime Minister, Mm -hmm. and the trade unions are, you know, objecting to him trying to impose an incomes policy. And they are warned about what will follow, but it follows anyway. Yeah, okay. And then we had Thatcher come in. (laughs) Right. And she wanted to break it up. And then we had this... uh, adoption of first monetarism and then they dropped that but then this broader framework of neoliberalism which Mm -hmm. focused on controlling the money supply it also wanted a smaller state um, and it thought the private sector and the free market was the solution to the country's problems Mm -hmm. so that took a long time I think uh, to come about and one of the interesting things I think always about the Thatcher period is that public service funding actually went up for Mm -hmm. many Mm -hmm. of those years but as you say that um, nightmare of unemployment was broken it was much that the emphasis within the political imagination shifted. 
Yeah, and I would I would argue that I mean drawing on work from you know uh, some great historians like you know David Edgerton and Chris Rennick and so on that um, actually seeing the core of the mm. post war settlement as the welfare state actually slightly misses it. Mm. Its full employment is the absolute yeah. core because the welfare state is growing for a hundred years before nineteen forty five, and in some ways it's the middle class that gets more of a welfare state. There was a sort of judgmental fissiparous one for working class people to a degree before that, and as you say, it continues after nineteen seventy nine and the funding goes up. If you look at it on the basis of employment, though, that's where you get a really stark turn, as I talked about with unemployment, but also in terms of the power of the trade unions. They have these two employment acts in 1980 and 1982, doing things that, you know, tellingly perhaps for today, Thatcher wasn't really ready to advocate before she came into power. And it's that turn, the combination of mass unemployment and making effective strikes harder that underpins everything you've described. And then we move into the 90s. John Major uh, secured Thatcher's legacy. He went a bit further on trains, for instance. Tony Blair comes in, Mm -hmm. adamant that he's not going to upset what she created. He wants to ameliorate it in some ways, uh, create Thatcherism with a human face, perhaps. Uh, But he also wanted to increase public service funding and welfare. So it was a sort of, you know, let's keep the, the system, the structures the same. But let's try and deal with some of the excesses, some of the more ugly parts of it. Yeah, it's about moving where the money lies more than moving where the power lies. Yeah. And that's really what I'm talking about. This sort of messy process of the death of consensus is about power mm. shifting. And I think that's more the ground that we're now in. Mm. And you can hear Labour people talking in that way now. Now, I mean, you know, new Labour people would say with some justification that the, the, uh, the Blair government was very, very different from the Thatcher government. Um, but I completely agree that there is the frame around that, that, you know, we mustn't go back to the 1970s. Blair says that in terms a couple of months before the 1997 election. And it's actually on the sort of social front yeah. that you get something and much more different. Front yeah, as well. yeah. And I would argue that actually there's a pattern there too, which is that in the 1960s, you've got enough of a settlement that there's kind of headspace mm. for a little while for the Wilson government, those Roy Jenkins sponsored yeah. private members bills to ease things up. You get the expansion of the universities begun by the Conservatives as well. Uh, the Wolfson Report is set going by the Conservatives. Similarly, in the 90s, there's enough headspace economically that you can have some social change. Again, I think that's a big difference to where we are now. 2008, financial crisis. Right. We see uh, a collapse in um, trust in authority and institutions as well. Throughout the noughties, we had um, a growing number of um, child abuse scandals. We had the expenses scandal in 2009. The Conservative government comes in, austerity. That's their response to uh, the increase in the budget deficit that we saw uh, in response to the financial crisis. So the great or the interesting thing, I think, about the end of your book is that you leave it open almost. You say, okay, we've had um, some blows made against that Thatcherite consensus that we had from the 1980s. We've had, first of all, the financial crash. Then we had austerity. We've had Brexit as well. We've seen Boris Johnson uh, talking about increasing public service funding. We've had the hiring of 20,000 police officers. Um, So where are we now? What's the question? Well, I mean, I think the the way to think about all of these processes is a sort of series of failed attempts to get the new nightmare to dominate, basically. So I think, you know, through what you've described, through, you know, red Tory and blue Labour, and even early on, in a way, the big society, and then, you know, Theresa May and just about managing and then levelling up, they're all attempt, and and the Brexit vote, and, you know, briefly the interpretation of it afterwards until we go into the kind of paralysis for three years. Um, All of those, I think, essentially are attempts to say, excuse me, could we actually just attend to the dying high streets and the flatlining pay? But there are two other nightmares that are very noisy, uh, not least because of, you know, uh, our colleagues <laughs> in the media. One is the nightmare that we're going to end up like Greece. George Osborne immediately seizes on what happens in Greece in 2009. But the other is the sort of liberal nightmare. You know, not for no reason that Brexit and attendant uh, phenomena, rise of UKIP and so on, is taking us towards a sort of authoritarian, populist, nationalist, kind of potentially really nightmarish uh, sort of polity. And I would argue that that's actually kind of got in the way of getting the uh, the basic economic nightmare that an awful lot of people have been you know, enduring and which is now becoming prominent. Yeah. But it took a long time to fight its way around those other nightmares. And so the question now is, are we sufficiently focused on that? We're a lot more focused on it than we were. Are we sufficiently focused on that? that we can actually downgrade the nightmares that underpinned the Thatcherite can settle, uh, settlement mm. in order to really do things which didn't seem possible before. So do you think there's a tension between 
um, bringing about this new consensus, which we could argue um, sees a greater role for the state in protecting people against market forces. It also is slightly more skeptical of globalization. Um, it also thinks that the private sector can't do anything and we shouldn't try and instill free market principles into the public sector, for instance. Is that in tension with this other nightmare, you could say, which has been in the past 10 years, immigration? It was a huge driver of uh, the Brexit vote. We saw uh, concern about immigration go through the roof in the early 2010s when the migrant crisis in the uh, Mediterranean kicks off. I mean, are those two in tension or are they the same? Well, it's complicated, isn't it? I mean, I think the problem with immigration, oh, a problem with immigration, is that it is always simultaneously literal and metaphorical, yes. often for the same person. So, you know, I think, I'm not saying people were, were you know, saying something they didn't mean, but I think a lot of the kind of um, angst around immigration in the early 2010s, you mentioned, is sort of inextricably bound up with economic problems. And then Brexit sort of crystallises that into this sort of strange paradox where you get a combination of sort of free marketeers and a kind of, you know, disgruntled working class people in Sunderland voting yeah. for the same thing. And your interpretation of that can be motivated accordingly. Actually, Dominic Cummings' sort of big argument was it's not about necessarily reducing immigration, I think, so much as controlling immigration in the sense of taking back control, you know, which, again, has much broader resonance, I think, as a political message, which he was, you know, made no bones about. You know, that, I think, was was kind of crucial at that point. But I think, I think it's shifted now. I think it's kind of become a, a different kind of issue than it was 10 years ago somehow. On the face of it, it looks the same. But the whole focus on small boats is a focus less about numbers, less about a huge sort of influx to, you know, do low paid jobs. There's very little talk around the small boats issue to do with the economy. So the two things, do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not people yeah. saying that it's about pay. Yes. And so I think those two things have bifurcated. And so the small boats thing, as pursued by some people in the government, or recently in the government, looks much more clearly like a kind of culture war thing. Mm. And the economic issue is slightly separate. Now, not to say that, you know, the broader issue of the immigration has been, you know, has gone away. No, I mean, it's interesting you say that because we have seen some of the highest immigration numbers ever in, 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 in recent years, in part because of people coming from Ukraine and Hong Kong, but also just uh, because of the new liberal migration system that we've instituted after Brexit. Mm -hmm. So if those things are becoming uh, more separate in the political imagination, does that open up a space for Labour to come through and seize control of that first conception of the, the new consensus, which is focused on the state, focus on um, insecurity? I mean, you wrote a great piece for us, I think, uh, a month or so ago, which basically looked at this issue and, and asked that question. Is Keir Starmer's Labour going to be the midwife of this new consensus or just simply the pool bearer uh, for the last? Well, um, in terms of um, whether they can make the kind of the uh, economy-focused version of this uh, central to a new consensus. I think it is cl clearly much more possible to make that argument now, and I think that's one reason why they are not just ahead in the polls for five minutes after the Liz Truss debacle, but actually have stayed there, is because, contrary to what a lot of people were saying between 2016 and 2019, you know, the economy has, for reasons you don't need me to rehearse, become much more central in ordinary voters' lives, and that, in the end, is what has to drive a new consensus. Um, and so, no, I think there is a possibility that they can make something that is built on what they're now referring to as the, sort of the nightmare of insecurity. I mean, you can begin to see a sort of mantra in Starmer's and Reeves's rhetoric and other people's that we must never go back, as I say in the piece, you know, we must never go back to the insecurity of the 2010s yeah. and early 2020s. But what that's predicated on in terms of really embedding it as a new settlement is also, and this is the difficult bit, also downgrading, loosening up on the nightmares that underpinned the post-79 settlement. Mm. Whether they can do that is still open for debate. Yeah. So I wrote a piece, I think, a month or so ago that basically said that Liz Truss is a much greater problem for Labour than it has been for the Conservative Party. I was being slightly hyperbolic there. But the point was that because Labour reacted to the Liz Truss mini-budget in such a way that said, we can't borrow, rather than we can't borrow to fund tax cuts instead of investment, uh, that they've hemmed themselves in and uh, cut off certain options for them once they get into office. I mean, do, is that fair? I mean, I'm very critical sometimes of the rhetoric coming out about um, managing debt because it seems to me that to respond to some of the insecurity we've seen in the past 10, 20 or uh, 30 years, you need a massive state investment. Well, I think 
the, the distrust debacle, the catastrophe, does uh, a good thing and a bad thing for Labour. It does what you've described, but it also gives a really sort of vivid image right in the heart of government. It's a nightmare. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, and, and of particularly of the sort of the, another element of my sort of thesis of, of the guilty men at yeah. work. I mean, Starmer actually called them guilty men and women yeah. at the dispatch box the other week. You know, uh, that the, they have essentially done what was happening in Partygate and in the crash, which was recklessly serving their own sort of group self-interest, effectively, mm-hmm. causing an enormous mess, and expecting everybody else to clear it up after them. So it's useful to Labour. And as you say, it's also a constraint. But on the constraint, I think the rhetoric from Labour is you know, not entirely on one line. I think you've certainly seen that side of it, but you also see, you know, Starmer talking about, you know, borrowing to save, you know, the idea that, you know, particularly with the green agenda, the longer we leave it, the more expensive it's going to get and sort of pushing back at that sort of what's sometimes unfairly, but maybe not totally... Uh, thought characterised as treasury brain that, you know, if we spend £5 now, that's terrible because we're spending £5 but we might have to spend 15 years' time if we don't. That sort of argument you can see coming through from Labour as well. So I think it's more ambiguous and I think partly we know why that is, right? It's because, you know, they are being very, very careful before an election. I'm not saying they're going to kind of pull a, you know, rabbit out of a hat in a mendacious way but I do think that, you know, you talk to people, you know, close to Starmer and they will say, well, you know, you don't set a budget in a manifesto. Budget's set at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, you set a direction of travel and some basic principles and some key policies and then you see what unfolds. And I think it's perfectly possible to see, you know, post a Labour victory, if there is one, that becoming the basis of something that's a little bit more close to what you're after than their rhetoric suggests at the moment. Yes. So I'd agree with that. And we know that... Um Labour are extremely concerned about giving the Tories anything that uh, they can criticise them with about being uh, prolific with public funds or or whatever it is. My concern is that some of the things that Rachel Reeves says seems very genuine. You know, she used to work at the Bank of England. She has been institutionalised as an economist for a very long time. She recently came out and and said that she wants to give the OBR, this independent um, body of experts, even more power um, over setting the narrative and the framework around which fiscal policy is decided. So that seems to me to be another sign that they're going to invest um, in the consensus, the the consensus that we've had since 2010, because it was George Osborne who set up the OBR to try and constrain government spending. Well, yeah, and it's certainly possible that the, that becomes the dominant Rachel Reeves. There is another Rachel Reeves, though. Yeah, the Securonomics. The Securonomics Rachel, Rachel Reeves, yeah. but also the kind of a, a rhetoric which is directed at the old you know, mm. arguments, the old consensus, you know, talking about the failure of trickle-down, talking about, you know, just making money in one part of the country and sort of dropping it by helicopter on the rest of the country and how we need to fundamentally reorder how we work, you know, industrially mm. and, you know, having a much more active state, as you say, securonomics. And, you know, and that is a response to lots of things that, you know, are relatively new and weren't really dominant, you know, when a certain David Cameron was yeah. prime minister. Yeah. So, you know, there are two Reeves, just as there are, you know, two or three Starmers yeah. and so on. So we'll see. But I think what this is partly predicated on, you know, is what happens. You know, it's frustrating to try and write history about the present, right? Because you can't summarise the whole period. You have to wait day by day to see what's unfolding. And I think, you know, if you imagine looking back at this in 30 years' time and which bits we're going to just skip over between paragraphs and which bits we're going to focus on, that's not yet clear. So it may be, it may be that circumstances push them towards more radicalism than they are currently articulating. Yeah, and it is ambiguous. Um, Keir Starmer takes advice from Tony Blair... He speaks very positively about New Labour in many ways, but he's also quite critical. Um, it seems to me as if he's very willing to take advice from Tony Blair about winning elections, less mm-hmm. so about policy. He uh, mentioned in a speech the other day that uh, New Labour, well, he didn't actually direct at New Labour, but I think it was very clear um, who was his target, that uh, New Labour basically pursued a, a policy of economic growth that saw huge amounts of... Um, investment and growth in the city in London, the South East, and then through their welfare policies, through tax credits, uh, through child benefits, they saw that money redistributed around the country. And now it's completely anathema to where Keir Starmer and Rachel Rees want to see economic policy because they want to see growth and productivity growth um, in every region around the country. It's a completely different thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I think the, the place you can see uh, sort of Blair logic mm. most strongly, I think, in some ways. I mean, I take your point about, you know, Reeves and, you know, fiscal caution, but, you know, 
as you said, that's not the only driver, is actually in a sort of triangulatory logic applied sort of strategically. So from security comes hope. So I know they're very concerned not to say that, you know, fighting insecurity means that everybody has to kind of give up on any sort of aspiration, yeah, right? Right? Mm-hmm. right, but from security comes hope, you know, talking about borrowing to save, that sort of triangulatory is just like, you know, social justice on the foundation of a strong economy. Yeah. You know, that seems to me a much more useful way to think about, you know, New Labour's undoubtedly very successful strategic operation in the 1990s and stuff that was specific to the 90s. And, you know, those that sort of policy shift that you're talking about is essentially, you know, the shift in power, not just in wealth, right? And that is not just something Starmer has said once. I mean, that's there in multiple Reeve speeches, multiple Starmer yeah. speeches. So that does feel like a pretty strong line coming through. What about this conception that the new nightmare will be insecurity? In the past, it seems like it's been quite specific. Mm-hmm. Uh, unemployment, mm-hmm. uh, overbearing trade unions. Mm-hmm. Insecurity just seems to be a, an umbrella description for all of those things. Well, and, and for others besides, yeah. you know, the environment, and the think, supply chains. Really. Well, right, exactly. And I think, you know, it's te- that's why it's taken quite a long time, I think, to find one word that, you know, covers it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's also, as you say, it's less vivid, you know, the image of the 1930s, even when Keith Joseph was yeah. taking it down or the Tories were co-opting it, the doll cues, yeah. very, very... Yeah clear and seared into the minds of millions of people. Likewise, and present in plays and novels right, and culture. Right, right, Likewise, picket lines outside hospitals yeah. or whatever, you know, Nightmare Thatcher was waving in, mm. you know, the newspapers of 1979 at every election, you know, that she fought thereafter. And so, no, there isn't as vivid a nightmare. I think the other reason, another reason for this, actually, I mean, you just mentioned plays, is it's striking how little of that has been, you know, made into vivid images, made into vivid characters, you know, by drama, by TV drama, by movies. I mean, where is the love on the doll of the yeah. 2010s? And that feels like a real failing. And I think that's partly because that's how politics has shifted, right? Politics conducts itself less in terms of sort of vivid image and, you know, story and meme, really, and much more in terms of focus groups. And now the kind of vivid images that you hear, what I mentioned in the piece, is of people weeping in focus groups because they're so desperate for change but can't believe that there's anything that can be done. Now, if those sorts of images could be made as concrete as the dole cues and the picket lines, then Labour may be able to make more progress. You think, you think that will suffice? No, I don't think it's on its own, but I think just to answer that specific issue. Yeah. But no, I mean, on your broader point, that insecurity is a sort of, you know, big jelly-like, um, yeah. you know, abstract noun. Yeah, of course. But I think that's the nature of the problem they're trying to solve. It is harder to pinpoint partly because it's social as well as economic. It's not, you know, I've been emphasising the yeah. economics, but it is also about a sense of you know, place and pride and all those sorts of things that, you know, Blue Labour and then, you know, Nick Timothy and to some extent Dominic Cummings talked about, you know, and that's hard to kind of meld with heating bills. Yes, it is. Um, and that's why we get the term insecurity. Is right. part of the problem that politics itself has been so divided mm-hmm. in the past 10 years that we can't settle or agree upon the problem? Having said that, it does seem to me that both parties have been coalescing around problems, if not solutions. Mm-hmm. Um they both agree that we need to deal with uh, high prices. Depends how they want to do that, but they agree with the problem. I mean, there seems to be a series of issues whereby everyone can agree this needs to be addressed. We need to address growth. You've got Keir Starmer saying that you know, six months before Liz Truss came into office, mm-hmm. and then it, she defines her whole uh, premiership by it. Mm-hmm. And industrial policy and, you know, place and migration and, you know, restoring a sense of pride and all sorts of things, you know. And, the, you know, the, the inadequacies kicked off by the crash, you know, Nick Timothy and Theresa May articulating concerns about pay yeah. in 2016 and so on. No, it's been, as I say, it's been this sort of lurching process of it coming to the fore and then the other two nightmares kind of coming back in. But, no, I think, as you say, I think the parties have actually at different points, you know, circled around, you yeah. know, a fa- actually a fairly coherent agenda. I mean, this is one, one way I think that the, the sort of historical analogy is quite useful. I mean, I cannot get Tony Benn out of my head whenever I see the Conservative Party at the moment. It is extraordinary. I mean, yeah. they're, you know, what they're doing now seems to me to be very similar to what happened after the 1979 election, but also actually, in a subtler way, what happened before. I mean, if you think about what Bernard Donoghue mm-hmm. was, as uh, Callaghan's policy chief, was sort of pushing them towards in terms of things like, you know, buying, letting, letting people buy their own council houses, like his own mum and dad, or the Ruskin speech about focusing education more on skills and training, or the famous, you know, 1976 conference speech talking about, you know, uh, a sort of end to the Keynesian method. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the end of the Keynesian method, not to the goal of full employment. And there was a kind of, you know, almost a sort of labour monetarism emerging. But, of course, the Labour Party 
wouldn't allow them to go there. You know, council house sales is taken by the Conservatives. Yeah. I think you can see a very similar process in a way with Johnson trying to get towards this sort of agenda for all his manifest and manifold mm -hmm. issues, you know, towards something which actually is quite similar towards what Labour is offering now. But then the kind of residual, like the Labour left in the late 70s, the sort of Tory kind of uh, adherence to an old Thatcherite sort of model. I mean, you know, Sunak literally said, I will govern like Thatcher if I win. Yeah. You know, it made me think that like Michael Foote saying, I will govern like Attlee if I win. Yeah. You know, I think, I think they are being pulled back. The question then is if Labour get across the line, whether they can do... Uh, but they can be more free of those. Yeah, um, completely. The um, premierships of both Truss and Sunak weren't really supposed to happen. Right. You know, we had the 2019 election, Conservatives got a 80 seat majority. Uh, Boris Johnson was supposed to bring about this new age of investment in public services, uh, this optimism about the future, this sense of community, uh, emphasis on the nation. And he messed it up. In, right. in part because of his personal failings. But it is remarkable now that Rishi Sunak, in so many ways, um, yes, yeah, he is on the right on many issues that he doesn't always get credit for, but he's also reverting back uh, to both the style of politics and some of the stuff, substance in terms of his fiscal conservatism of the coalition, David Cameron, George Osborne years, and he's just made David Cameron his foreign secretary. I mean, what right. better sign of decline or, you know, a cyclical, um, or you, you call it cyclical, you can just see it driving around in circles right. of a government that just doesn't know or speak in the language uh, that much of the country is. I mean, I found it remarkable that Rishi Sunak thought the biggest thing or one of the biggest things that he should focus on this year is an AI summit. Right. right. And not... For, not sell it in terms of jobs or you know protecting people against insecurity, yeah. but in terms of well, let's have innovation, let's take risks, let's see uh, whether we can attract lots of big companies, large American companies to the UK. It seems to be completely out of sync with where the country is. Well, and particularly that extraordinary line when I think he was talking to Elon Musk about you know wanting people to take more risks for their job security in order yeah. to set up small businesses. I mean, yeah. you know, fundamentally, lovely. But, you know, just in terms of the sort of tin eardness of talking like that, when everybody knows his own financial situation. And I don't believe he's actually set up a company himself, I don't think, unless it was a hedge fund early on. But mostly he's been working for large organisations, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that sort of talk is, is you know, clearly coming from, you know, like I say, like the Labour left in the late 70s, a sort of, you know, a kind of comfortable sliding back into territory where, you know, it's not ideologically challenging. And that's, you know, to Johnson's credit, not what Johnson was doing mm. in 2019. I mean, you go even further with your, you know, trust and Sunak weren't meant to happen. I mean, if May had, you know, if the social care policy hadn't happened, we might be in the second May term now. <laughs> and that was the plan. <laughs> well, right. I mean, I just want to ask you briefly about... Um, the influence on senior Labour figures at the moment, you spoke to quite a few of them for your piece, which everyone should go and read. I mean, what are they reading? What are they? What, what sort of historians are they into? Because I ask this question sometimes and I get a, a blank response. Well, I don't, I'm not sure I can tell you uh, which historians they're reading, but one thing I've been very, very struck by mm. is the degree to which they're going back, uh, as I have in the book, to, you know, Attlee and also Thatcher, yeah. you know, in the run up to their now apparently inevitable epochal victories. And the number of um, Labour advisors that I spoke to who've been, you know, obviously not in terms of the, the policy specifics, but in terms of the sort of the strategy and the rhetoric and the mm. positioning that Thatcher was using in 1977, 78, early 79 has been really striking. You know, Thatcher's conference speech in 1978 in particular, I think there is a real lesson, as I say in the piece, that's waiting there, which I do think they are now finding. I think you can see this in Starmer's speech strategically, you know, with its appeal to d disillusioned conservative voters, you know, with its sense that, you know, yes, the guilty men are, you know, letting us down in terms of rack concrete in schools or the water supply, but ordinary decent teachers, the body of the country, the people are doing the right thing. Ordinary decent people are clearing up the rivers. And isolating exactly like Thatcher did with the wreckers within the trade unions yeah. in the late 70s, isolating them into a sort of, you know, core of guilty man from whom the country needs to be liberated. That seems to me to be a useful lesson from, you know, their reading. Phil, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.